Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the SAFCO webinar, uh, where we're going to look at our private equity uh, annual survey results for 2021. And we're going to do things a little bit differently this year. Usually, we would share all the survey results in one sitting, and we will go through the trends and, and what happened from a deal activity perspective. But we're starting off this year with volume one, which is the strategic insights. So we're really going to look at what the impact was on the private equity industry from a COVID perspective, what are some of the strategic priorities, and what the future looks like from an operating model, model perspective. And to help us here this afternoon to unpack that uh, as we share the results is uh, Sitembile Nkabinda, who's going to be our panel moderator. Uh, she will be leading the conversation with her formidable panel. And um, we invite you to engage with us. We'll have some uh, polling and menti questions that we'll ask you to um, complete. And we also want you, if there's any specific questions that you want to ask our panel, to use the Q&A function to engage with us. Um, Sitembile, thank you so much. Just as a reminder, Sitembile is the founder and chief executive officer of Kulasande Capital Partners. And it's uh, wonderful to have you here with us this afternoon, all the way from Kenya. So we can really say this is a, an African perspective. Uh, Sitembile, I'm going to hand over to you to lead the conversation with the panel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sanger. A warm welcome from Kenya. I understand it, it is a bit cold currently in, um, in Johannesburg or in South Africa. Welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us for this conversation and spending your afternoon with us. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the insights from our panel um, on what I think will be a very interesting discussion on strategic insights from our survey that was done recently. So we have three topics to unpack today. The first one will be unpacking the context of the year that has been uh, 2020. Uh, the second theme will be around creating resilience and priority setting in a post-COVID world. And the third theme will be around creating agility for growth and operating models. All these topics are very relevant um, and very, very um, interesting topics given what the year that we've been through um, in 2020. So we'd like you to also participate in this conversation. Although we have an awesome panel lined up, we'd like to hear your insights. So you'll see on the screen right now, can please participate and give us your input through www.menti.com. Go in and sign up, enter the code 4302-6098. And as we ask questions, you can put in a word or choose a, a, a answer that you think is most relevant. We'd like to hear your insights. We'd like to hear your inputs as well uh, this afternoon as we go through the session. So without further ado, let me introduce um, our formidable panel this afternoon. We have uh, Dr. Zuko uh, Kumbugeli, who is the CEO and principal of Pape Fund Managers. Welcome Zuko, if you can please put on your camera. Yeah, thank we you. We also Hi. have with us. We also have with us Graham Stoker, who is the uh, par a partner and private capital leader of ENY Africa. Welcome, Graham. Good to have you. And finally, we have Mame Dupi uh, Matsipa, who is the CEO <coughs> of Atta Capital, um, who will also be joining us this afternoon. Welcome, Mame Dupi, and thanks to the panelists for joining us in this conversation this afternoon. Perfect. So before we get into I think we've got Stembile frozen. So while Stembile is uh, un while she unfreezes herself from Kenya, maybe we can start with the first Menti question if we can have that up. And I hope everyone saw uh, the Menti link. It's menti.com uh, with the code there 4302-66098. And we're asking you, what word would you use to describe 2020? Um, so when you think about 2020, what word comes to mind? Uh, there's uh, three options that you can put in. So if you think crazy and interesting um, are the words that you use to describe uh, 2020, Please use that. We're going to uh, gather the results and share a word cloud with us um, later as we <coughs> come back. Okay, until um, Sitembile is back, let me then continue with the conversation. Um, and uh, Graham, my first question is to you. Um, and the question just is, um, in your view, 
how has the pandemic impacted the economy? So if we look at business confidence, if we look at market prospects, what's really happened from your perspective from an EY helicopter view? Yeah, thanks, Tanya. Hi, Stembile. Hi, apologies for that. Uh, Graham, I assume you, uh, you've been asked the first question. Thanks, Tanya, for taking over while I had technical issues. Cool, cool, no worries. So yeah, I think uh, firstly, welcome everyone. And yeah, I think, look, we, we, we can't deny, I think 2020 was really a, a tough year. Um, but saying that, I think private equity showed, you know, some of its key characteristics. Um, we talk about nimbleness, uh, flexibility and responsiveness. And, and I think being in the private domain and, and working with entrepreneurs, I think private equity, you know, was able to, you know, really, I guess, roll up their sleeves and work closely with entrepreneurs. Um, interesting seeing the results. Um, you know, we haven't seen maybe as high a percentage as, as I thought in terms of a, a downward impact on portfolio companies um, from an economic perspective. And there was more sort of moderate than, than downward, obviously very few having a, an upward uh, trend. Um, but yeah, really, I think showing, you know, some of the key characteristics of, of private equity to, to shine through and really were, was a, a really tough year um, in, in 2020. I think looking forward, though, you know, I think the, the pandemic has also accelerated change and, and that change in digital transformation in transforming operating models has maybe hopefully set up uh, portfolio companies and private equity as a whole to, to accelerate change and and to really I guess set set the foundations for a, a growth trajectory um, in hopefully the not too distant future. Thanks, Graham. And uh, I think we're going to talk about that change and the, the changes that are coming with. If we can maybe get the, the first slide up where we actually look at um, the results that we have for the survey. And the first one is unpacking the context of 2020. So we asked really what was the impact on private equity activity and on portfolio performance. And the first one was the extent to which COVID impacted portfolio companies. The 59% said neutral, 30, uh, 59 said neutral, 39 negative, and 2% positive. Um, so not as grim as we would have expected. Um, so it could speak to um, how the industry was poised to support their portfolio companies, which I'd like us to get to a little bit later. Um, but then the assessment of impact on deal activity, 69% um, positive on recovery in deal activity. And then how has COVID impacted PE firms? Uh, if we also compare it to South Africa and the global PE, um, EY PE survey. And for South Africa uh, PE, it's moved to a remote workforce was one of the biggest impacts on the firms. And secondly, hold annual uh, meetings virtually. And then there was some impact um, or expected impact on deal activity. Um, but while we look at this, or our audience look, looks at this, Zuka, I want to ask you, from your perspective, what has been some of the biggest challenges when it comes to fundraising um, for South African private equity? Yeah, th thanks, Tanya. Look, the, the challenges are twofold. Um, just as we are looking to get capital into our funds, uh, you've got investors, fund of funds looking to meet prospective GPs. So, so it's a twofold um, challenge. Um, but getting in front of investors and investors getting in front of GPs is something that has to be done as part of the process. So I think as much as this last year, year and a half is gonna be a disruption. I think the fundamentals of that fundraising and deploying process will still be maintained. I mean, private equity and um, the GPLP relationship is very much a personal thing. I don't think it's gonna be done over Zoom and desktop analysis. You know, people are still gonna to wanna to kick the tires, meet the team, look at the whites of your eyes and understand your team dynamic and feel your chemistry and your energy within, within the team. So that, that will come back. But I think in the meantime, what GP should be doing is 
keeping the momentum going, you know, if you're raising a fund, by communicating with your potential LPs, telling them any developments in your team, in your pipeline, um, you know, sharpening your fundraising collateral, equipping your team. There's lots of training courses that SAFC has put out um, and readying it for when things open up, you know. So, so that's really how I, I think that I should be responding to it. Thanks, thanks, Zuquin. Thanks, Tang, again for taking over. I think that's uh, some very valid points around the personal touch is still very important when it comes to, to fundraising. Um, if we can please bring up the uh, results from the first uh, mentee question, um, and then we'd like to ask the audience again for um, their insights on fundraising. So um, we all understand that one of the greatest challenges for PE fund managers is uh, around fundraising. Um, so our next question will be around what do you think um, is the most challenging part of fundraising for South African PE industry? Um, and before we go into that, let me actually, um, okay, let, let's, let's rather, yeah, thank you for bringing that up again. Um, challenging, unprecedented, disruptive, some very, very relevant words, resilient, resetting, transformation, stressful, Wow, um, some very, very, and your some very, very interesting words coming up from uh, that survey that we just did. Thank you very much. So we'll just go on to our next question um, around fundraising challenges. So what do we see, what do you see as the greatest challenge facing South African P in this in industry uh, from a fundraising perspective? First, um, the first question being, or the first answer being fundraising has moved to virtual. Um, it's all Always been difficult to find a region and investment destination, exits and recent performance history or other challenge facing the South African PE industry um, as we speak. I mean, I'm going to come over to you. Um, just in regard to alternative funding, um, and what do you think are the challenges and opportunities in this regard? Yeah, th thank you, Stembile. I think from our perspective, um, we've recently closed our third fund. Um, and so I think uh, quite fresh in terms of some of the challenges that uh, we would have experienced from a fundraising perspective. Um, and I think given those challenges, it is easy to want to come to the conclusion that we need to look at alternative sources um, from a fundraising perspective. Um, and in general, I think as a fund manager, we do then look to see if there are in innovative ways of, for us to unlock other sources of capital. Um, having said that, though, I think um, one feels that we haven't quite entirely exhausted the existing and traditional sources of capital, you know, and, 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 and really being able to unlock those specifically into the private equity space. So for instance, if we look uh, specifically at the pension fund space, you know, um, I think we all know that despite even the changes that are being uh, spoken about around uh, increasing allocation to private equity for, uh, uh, for, for pension funds, um, from our perspective, I think we know that it's, it's, it's an area that is under allocated um, and, and, and it's not that those limits were reached. Um, and so a lot of the work um, that we have done specifically in our fundraising cycle has been around educating around the asset class, um, you know, allaying perceptions around the risk um, and liquidity issues. Um, and, and in the main, really trying to talk about the impact that private equity makes, uh, I think, uh, I guess, to, to, to the economy, and then also then trying to unlock those sources of capital. So other opportunities, Tembile, I think, um, you know, when we start looking at maybe widening it out um, into other um, sources, for instance, if you look at the financial services sector, you know, coming out of, um, you know, banks and, and insurance companies, and for instance, the changes um, in the financial sector scorecard, for instance, you know, there are talks around um, a, a specific element of the scorecard, for instance, around uh, black business growth funding. Um, for whatever reason, you know, that the momentum on that has been quite slow, um, but I think, um, you know, executed properly and implemented with intent, that could be also a, quite a big uh, source of capital coming into the fund manager space. So we're also looking to see how that would then play out in our space.
Perfect. Thank you, Manager Peace. I'm very. be some very interesting um Hi, it looks like the yeah. day is um, uh, gone again. So maybe there's some investment opportunities in Kenya for infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure. Um, that leads me to this question potentially then, where are the opportunities? Where, where's the pipeline or what has the impact been on pipeline and um, what has changed in terms of investment choices? Azuka, maybe you can kick us off and then Mamadupi can add. Zuka, you're on mute. Okay, so I think very little um, is the short answer. Um, we, I think what has surprised us um, is that we thought more opportunities would come, um, you know, with businesses being a little bit under pressure, under stress, um, et cetera. But <clears throat> I think we've got to um, applaud banks um lps funders i mean they really came to the party very quickly um you know in our fund our lps um very quickly allowed us to extend loans if there were working capital issues um and and the like so um so in our sector in the sector of the economy where we invest we, we just found that the guys who run the businesses the managers were were very resourceful. I think as a nation, we've seen obviously with the unrest of two weeks ago, is that you know when we when we're faced with challenges, we actually do get our act together and we do fix things very quickly. Um, so, and part of that fixing, certainly in our portfolio, we found that um, there was a lot of cost cutting. You know, there wasn't as much travel because you just couldn't. Um, people were working from home, so a lot of costs were down. Um, there was new product development. One of our firms came up with, uh, you know, they, were, they do clean and maintain infrastructure. So they came up, they bought some rights to an Australian technology that defogs and sanitizes. Um, so they've been rolling that out. Um, but there was generally, there's been a very good, quick responsiveness to demand um, that, that COVID and, and a lot of companies have brought and an ability to flex you know, your capacity and, and your volume. So, so we're still investing on the same investment thesis of, of the last 12 years. We, we haven't made any changes. So, so very little on, on our side. Thanks, Zuku. And Mabadipi, on your side, same sentiments or is it a little bit different? Uh, yeah. Stable? Tanya, I think from our perspective, I guess the, the strategy remains the same. I think um, maybe what COVID has done um, is, is really around, you know, the, the, the the, the implementation of some of those uh, strategies. Um, if you look at, for instance, just how we develop pipeline, you know, I think as Zuko alluded to it earlier at the core, you know, we're a people's business, you know, um, a lot of our deal making activities and fundraising activities are relationship driven. Um, and that really requires us to be out there. And I think COVID has almost, uh, I guess, restricted some of that, you know, spe specifically in trying to uh, develop proprietary deals. You know, I think there's a lot of deal flow that comes in through the door from, a, I guess, a, a process perspective. You know, I think, but I think from our preference, you know, having to go out and and and, and establish relationships and, and build your own pipeline of deals, that has been impacted a bit. I think obviously as the, the lockdown process uh, or, or situation has opened up, you know, that has obviously allowed us, um, you know, to go out there and start uh, looking for deals again. Um, I think from a uh, opportunity set perspective, um, and probably also driven by, by mandate, I think there is a, a general sense from our perspective that there is probably a lot more dry powder in the market. Um, and from that perspective, also then I guess a demand for really good deals. Um, and the deals that are there that are really good are demanding quite significant premiums. In, and you know, you're having to then assess, for instance, you know, the sustainability of that growth that they've experienced over this period, you know, I guess, and, and, and that obviously has uh, pricing implications. And for us, it's, it's really about implementing 
um, that pricing discipline, you know, I think, uh, you know, without uh, being influenced by what's out there and having to, um, I guess, want to close deals. Um, so from our perspective, I think um, uh, companies that have remained uh, uh, resilient um, uh, from, from a COVID perspective, you'd obviously look to, you know, to, to capitalize on those opportunities and, 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 and look for those companies that, that, that have sustained themselves. And yeah, I think that's, that, that's the main thing really, Tanya. Thanks, Mama Dibi. And something I've also heard from our members a lot is the fact that uh, the strength and resilience of the management teams have also played a significant role in 2020 um, from, from the, the interactions. Um, just a reminder, we got some Menti questions. We invite you to join us on menti.com. Uh, enter the code 43026098 and you can participate in our surveys uh, and we share the results frequently. And then also just a a comment from Michelle from Kenya saying there's nothing wrong with the digital infrastructure in Kenya. It really depends on who your service provider is, um, but there's always room for improvement and she's following from Kenya. So thank you for that comment, Michelle. Can we have the uh, results of the second Menti question so we can see what our audience thinks, why it's so difficult to raise funds? Okay, so the attractiveness of the region as an investment destination, and we frequently hear this when we engage with international investors. Um, we really have to sell the South African narrative and investment um, narrative in terms of the region as a destination. I see um, second is exit performance, exits and recent performance history, especially when you take it back into uh, dollar-based returns. So those are some really good feedback. Um, can we have the next Menti question, please? Um, and the next question is, what is your firm's priority for the next 12 months? And this is an open-ended question, so you can type your answers in. There's three options, or you can only choose one or select one, um, give us one priority if you like. And while our audience does that, Mamadipi, I'm going to come back to you. What, what is Atta's um, priorities or strategy for the next 12 months? Yeah, I think I think I, I want to go to maybe just the last 12 months. So firstly, I think as in the last 12 months, it is really about um, the priorities were around ensuring that firstly, the team was safe um, and, and obviously moving to a, a work from home, uh, I guess, uh, environment. Um, and then we were also then around, uh, really uh, focused around business continuity and making sure that we could adjust our current operating model um, in order to cater for the challenges coming out um, from, a, from a COVID perspective, especially, I guess, um, from my earlier point around inability to move around and, and do what we do best from originating deals and, 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 and pipeline development. Um, I think strategically, um, our long-term ambitions of growth remain. Um, and so if we're looking for the next pipe, uh, I guess, 12 months, um, it, it really is looking at you know, coming out of the learnings of the last 12 months, um, you know, for instance, business models have changed, you know, sector dynamics have changed to a certain extent as companies are, um, I guess, uh, making themselves a bit more resilient and, 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 and uh, you know, pivoting as, as the key word has been in the last uh, 12 months. Um, and so really it is around unearthing some of those opportunities, you know, understanding where the changes have happened um, and then seeing if there are new, um, I guess, deal making opportunities coming out of those changes, you know, so really bedding that down. I think uh, internally, um, driven by our uh, strategic uh, growth objectives, it is really about making sure that um, our operational efficiencies are in place, um, you know, so that we are geared for, for that growth. So it's, it's the little things, Tanya, I think, you know, making sure that we are correctly staffed. Um, you know, that we have uh, ways of, I guess, identifying new deal opportunities, um, you know, optimizing our due diligence processes and, and deal execution processes, and, and really just, I guess, uh, efficiencies around, uh, I guess, reporting. So bedding down all of that um, and, and in order to gear ourselves up um, for, for growth over the next couple of years. Perfect. So it really is about forward thinking, uh, learning the lessons, applying those and, and doing things much more, much more efficiently. Um, Graham, there was a question in the QA box that I'd like to ask you, um, specifically uh, on the opportunities front, um, 
if you see or EYC sectors as growth areas uh, in the medium term, if there's any particular sectors that you're seeing as interesting sectors. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. So I think, uh, I guess the narrative we've heard uh, so much from PEAS and other investors is, is technology. Um, FinTech, we've, we've seen a lot about. Um, but say, saying that, you know, I think in the COVID time and, and you know, even right till now, I think it's also those resilient uh, sectors and companies. So Mamedupe spoke earlier about resilient companies. And if you think about it, you know, you have to have a buyer and seller willing to get to the same price to, to, to get to a deal. And those companies that have shown resilience and, you know, you, you've got more predictability of where it's going, you're able to, to get to a deal. But you know, saying that, you know, we definitely see technology, fintech, um, data centers, uh, fiber, all those areas as, as fast growth areas. I think it still lends itself to tying to the, the consumer, storing, uh, consumer story and a growing de demographic, but it's almost like that tech has been the first word rather than, you know, the, this Africa consumer story um, and it's really about you know the technology and and having companies at the forefront of, of that growth that that's go, that's leading to the exciting and, and interesting opportunities thanks graham and uh, i see we've got the priority setting in covid and post covid world slides these are the results from the survey and it asks how are pe firms thinking about strategy for the next 12 months uh, the challenges facing PE firms uh, and the top strategic priorities, uh, the left South Africa, as well as a comparison to the global EYPE survey. And then what steps has your PE firm taken to prepare portfolio companies for an economic downturn? We'll also share the PDF at the end if people want to get into some of the detail of those statistics. But number Dupi, coming back to you, just in general, what should PE firms' top strategic priorities be in the medium and long term? Um, Tanya, I think at, at the risk of sounding a, a bit philosophical, I think, uh, you know, the, the events of the last couple of uh, weeks, you know, the impact of COVID um, probably does force us to look a, a bit more around uh, um, our, I guess, delivery and operating model. You know, I think we, we live in, in, in an, an equal society, unemployment levels are increasing. Um, and I think uh, from a COVID perspective, you know, the pandemic has really just, uh, you know, made that worse in an economy that was really ailing prior to that. Um, and I think as a PE manager, I think um, we can probably create far more value, um, especially in the work that we can do, um, specifically in these challenging times. So I think as, as, as PE, we are really best placed um, to channel our capital um, into the right places, you know, and in order to preserve, you know, jobs, uh, to drive growth, to drive, you know, uh, uh, transformation, you know, and really lead companies. So I think uh, from a, a strategic uh, goals perspective, definitely in the medium to long term, um, as PDP managers, I think we need to look at our business model and see how we start addressing some of those. You know, we, we are at, in a position where we can impact uh, and add value and, and drive growth. Um, and some of that has really, has to be driven by, by, by you know, I guess the societal ills um, um, in our country. You know, I think our clients are demanding it, our LPs are demanding it, you know. And so we really need to start looking at our operating model and seeing how we start, um, you know, uh, implementing that in our delivery model. Yeah, and looking at the, the fundamental role we can play in the economy now and in the future. Um, Zuka, I want to come to you and I want to ask you, um, from your perspective, what are you doing differently now versus pre-COVID? So, um, specific, specific, sort of especially achieving asset growth in the current uh, challenging climate. So, how do you really grow those assets specifically in this tough economic environment? Yeah. <clears throat> I think um, if you, you know, that, that we're seeing a lot of capital coming to private equity. Um, I think on the back of poor listed company performance, um, look, that's changed in the last couple of months. 
Um, but I think a lot of pension funds and investors have realized that they don't like that volatility um, that is inferred on capital markets or stock markets uh, as a result of, of these um, global issues. So, uh, and I think the advantages of private equity still remain. We, we add value, uh, we reduce volatility to portfolios, we counter cyclical, um, and as long as we're not, uh, which most private equity firms aren't doing in South Africa, which is delisting companies, these massive companies, the, this areas where we're playing, which is small, medium enterprises, those companies are still growing regardless of what GDP is doing. Um, so, so if you look at the previous SAVCA performance surveys, you know, the smaller private equity funds have done relatively better than the large caps, you know, and the, the, the buyout funds um, and the high leverage funds, um, you know, deploying large amounts of capital. So, so, so we haven't, so the short answer again, we haven't really had to change much. You know, the, you look at the order book, you listen to what your clients are saying, do they need more of this, less of that, um, and you respond to that. Um, but obviously for us, we've, we've, uh, how we've also addressed it is just to give more support to our investee company uh, management teams, um, being more empathetic, helping them with research, asking them questions, and really seeing where we can, where we can help and understanding that, you know, it's not easy when people are working from home and they need to get us reports by the 10th and it's now the 12th, you know, you've got to understand that some things just aren't going to happen as efficiently as before. So, um, but again, very little, you just, you just provide support and you respond on a month by month basis. So um, there was a question that came through and I see Graham offered an answer, but I'd just like to hear from your perspective as well. It asked, um, how has the move to virtual impacted the due diligence process and what are some of the pros and cons or lessons learned over the period? Yeah, we, I mean, all, all that's happened on our front and I think most funds are the same is, you know, the first couple of meetings now, um, you just do virtually. Um, uh, and, and, you know, two months ago, I think everyone was starting to relax, but certainly with the Gauteng numbers of the last month, everyone's now kind of uh, not wanting to get out, you know, but, but I think as you get into the courting uh, process with due diligence and et cetera, uh, you can't avoid, you know, um, getting together. You, you, you have to go and kick the tires. You have to know where the premises are. Um, so, so I think the danger for, for, for all of us um, is there will be some things that stick, uh, you know, through this pandemic, um, but some stuff is gonna go, you know? So I'm really tired of these transparent um, little plastic things in front of tills, you know? I mean, that stuff's gonna go. You know, all these banners around um, health and COVID, uh, you know, there will be some normality um, that will return. Um, so, so we will look back in two, three years. Um, COVID will still be around. I mean, this thing's not going anywhere, but we will live with it. Um, but, but I think PE again is a people business. We, we need to, you know, we don't do our due diligence like uh, analysts who analyze um, listed companies, you know, where you download models, Excels, and you, and you buy and you sell, you know, we, we, have to, we have to get to know the people, we have to know where the business is, and, and I don't see that changing. If we have to go in there with masks and, you know, uh, oxygen tanks, I think that's what we'll do, you know, but, but we're not going to not go to the premises. <clears throat> I've heard one of, um, one, of our, one of our members, they did a, a due diligence uh, using GoPros and virtual tours. Um, so they, they did sort of kick the tires, although virtually. Um, so it is possible to adapt. The next question is for anyone on the panel. Um, it also, it's, it came through from Grant and Shireen, and it's very um, linked, but it talks about the attractiveness of the region. And has it changed over COVID or particularly in the last few weeks, given what has happened uh, with the unrest in the country? <coughs> and do we need some risk mitigation strategies uh, implemented going forward? So anyone on the panel that would like to answer those two questions? Yeah. I, saw, I saw your lips moving, Marjorie, but do you want to, but you're on mute. <laughs> 
you want to take it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a tough one, um, obviously, because it's, a you know, the, the events of the last couple of weeks, for instance, are probably, um, you know, the culmination of a lot of uh, things that have been bubbling under. Um, you know, in terms of attracting capital into the region, um, certainly from our perspective, you know, you have to, when you're trying to bring in external investors, you know, you, you're first having to, to sell SA Inc. Um, and, and the challenges around SA Inc. And, and, and the growth prospects, et cetera, you know, and I think those, you know, will remain. Um, and, and, and from our perspective, I think it, 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 is, it is difficult, you know, um, in terms of, you know, the, the guys that have potentially looked at SA in the past and are obviously looking at what's happening now and, and, and feeling a bit, um, you know, I guess despondent around where we see growth. But for, for, for in the main, it's always been driven by the fundamentals of the country um, and, and, and where we see that going. Um, and, and, and then to be honest, I think uh, the, the last couple of weeks have, have, have been bubbling under for a while. And, and we really then, you know, back to my, my, my last, uh, um, uh, I guess, answer, it was really about looking at ways to solve for those, for, for those problems. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a, there was a piece that um, someone wrote about during the unrest that, um, uh, you know, when when the election results came out in the US and the Republicans were, certainly the Trump supporters were very unhappy and they invaded the White House and um, Capitol Hill and et cetera. Uh, you know, that took America by, and took the world by some surprise. You know, when the French, uh, drivers in particular, I mean, they've blockaded freeways probably three times in the last seven, eight years. Um, so, so these things happen around the world, but sometimes, unfortunately, with the Afro-pessimism is that when it happens on the African continent, it's just blown completely out of proportion. Um, so, but again, these things take a couple of weeks, couple of months, and, 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 and people kind of accept them for what they are, that they can happen anywhere in the world. You know? And they might even open up new investment opportunities. Yeah. Look, yeah, I, I yeah. think a lot of, I think a lot of shopping centers are going to be beefing up security, beefing up shop fronts, um, because I think now that that kind of unrest has happened, I think it definitely now, it's much easier happening a second time. Um, uh, you know, so, so, so I think that, that, yeah, there definitely will be opportunities. I mean, I think we've seen with parking, going into parking um, garages and shopping centers. I mean, six, eight months ago, you had to press this little button to get your ticket. Um, you know, the guy who's making this near field sort of contact, whoever got those contracts, I mean, they must have done extremely well. I mean, that's, that's gonna, that's here to stay, you know. Um, so, yeah, so this 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 and this some winners and some losers, but um, but I still think PE is 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 necessary in the totality of a diversified um, portfolio. I think maybe to add is is you know maybe elevates the change we need in SA Inc. And I think private equity is part of the change in small and medium businesses and medium and and into the growth businesses and. You know, maybe there's a storm that's needed before uh, before there's a rainbow afterwards. And you know, yes, we've had had storm. I think you know, those of us here can have seen it for a while, and, and maybe it's elevated more globally. But um, you know, I think uh, private equity and the fast growth businesses that that we back can be can be part of the rainbow afterwards and, and be part of, you know, changing the story for SA Inc. Thank you, really appreciate it. It wasn't an easy question to answer and all three of you um, had the courage to answer. So thank you so much. Uh, for those of you who've just joined us, uh, we're using menti.com to get some of your inputs. Uh, if you've just joined us, please go to menti.com, enter the code 43026098. We'll add that to the, the chat function as well. And for those that have joined us 
for the entire event, you will be gifted with one CPD point, so um, some one less point to worry about this year or this cycle. Um, can we please get the results for question number three up, just so that we can see what the strategic priorities are for the next uh, 12 months? Definitely fundraising, growth, sustainability, deployment comes to the, the dry powder you were talking about, Mama Dupi, uh, deal origination, uh, exits, um, investing. So a lot of what we've already been talking about. If we can maybe ask the audience uh, question number four, please. And the question is, what are you finding, what are you finding most challenging in a COVID environment? Sourcing new deals, advising and supporting your portfolio companies, fundraising, preparing for and executing on successful exits or working as a cohesive team. Please make your selections there. Um, and then while you do so, uh, a quick question for Graham. Um, what are some of the investment themes that you've seen uh, being picked up in um, Southern Africa, but mainly in the African market, if you compare maybe South Africa to the rest of the continent? Yeah, I think let me expand on a few others I, I'd mentioned earlier on, on tech and stuff. I, I think, you know, other themes we're picking up is is on infrastructure. Um, so I, I would definitely say renewable energy, um, you know, and I, and I think South Africa's almost led the field then went to sleep and and I think we'll be catching up uh, again soon where there's been a lot in, in the renewable and energy sector across uh, Africa and then also on agri and food but uh, it goes back to you know the original comment of, of businesses more resilient less impacted by COVID and, and therefore getting to a, a buy and seller willing um yeah and then still emphasizing the the previous points i mentioned on tech uh fintech um and maybe another point to raise is is possibly a merging of vc and pe you know i think we've seen private equity go into vc backed businesses maybe in a, a series b and c and you know you know for africa to work, uh, you know, you've seen very successful and, and huge increases in, in VC investment. And, and I think we're seeing uh, private equity um, getting into to later stage uh, VC. Thanks, Graham. And maybe with that, we can close off the segment. And if we can see the results of question number four on Binti, eager to see what uh, the biggest challenge has been in a COVID environment. Um, sourcing new deals, that's interesting, uh, specifically because the panel um, seems like uh, they've, uh, they've got a good deal pipeline, but fundraising, unsurprisingly, at the top. Um, Zuko, Mamadipi, your views on the results? I see fundraising just uh, jumped up there. Um, <laughs> agree, disagree? Yeah, uh, look, I, I think fundraising and capital raising um, is, is, I mean, people, investors are still unsure where this all goes, you know? So I think it's just more, it's just gonna be longer lead times as, as investors kind of assess where they wanna be, you know, how this all settles, um, how the current portfolios are performing. Um, but again, uh, you know, the fundraising machinery is not gonna change over one year. Um, it's, it's quite entrenched as to how it works and how the LPs um, talk and exchange notes. Um, uh, so it, it's just a longer uh, sort of sales process, but uh, I think capital needs to be deployed um, and, and GPs just need to be patient. It's, that's, that's all it is, um, but it's this, this, uh, this money will come to the sector. Thanks, Zuko. And maybe with that, we can go to, to the next <coughs> segment. Uh, which is really about creating resilience and agility for growth and operating models. Uh, if we can maybe ask our final mentee question. And the question is, what will you change about your employee value proposition to remain relevant? Zuko, earlier you said private equity is a people's business, although a lot of people might have thought it's a numbers business. There was also a comment that came through in the chat. Uh, so while people are... Uh, 
adding their answers. Zuko, maybe I can ask you this. Um, let's go to the, the people conversation first before we talk about digitization. But the comment in the chat was interesting to see that talent management is a higher priority globally compared to the local survey. Would, would you um, love, to, would you think that we still have a war for talent? Uh, it would be interesting to hear from the panel. Uh, Zuko, I know you do a lot of space in the in the talent development space within private equity what is your your views on this yeah look the, this we, we have a multitude of challenges obviously in south africa we need to transform the sector um uh you know there's a whole sector of this economy that is untapped by private equity because it's not well understood um so so that's what transformation will bring to the sector. And that means you have to be pulling and upskilling people from all parts of our society, um, which also comes back to the point that Mama Duki made around um, addressing all the issues, all the societal issues at a range of, at a range of levels. You know? so, um, so, you know, unless we've got more GPs that have got good experience, we won't get more capital into the sector. Um, and we can't have a concentration of GPs looking at the same opportunities. That's just going to increase asset pricing and, and the returns over time will come down and then the sector will be unattractive. But we're still missing out on large parts of our economy, the township economy, the, you know, the non-banked economy is still massive in this country. So, um, so we, as GPs, I think we all need to be broader and contribute to one upskilling the talent because private equity is difficult, you know, in the sense that you can't just go and do a three, four year course and now you know private equity. It is about time, it's about experience um, and and it's experiential, you know, so so it does take time, but but we need to be diversifying our teams. And that I think will sustain not only our own businesses, but but the industry. You know, we need people from that bring different context to how they analyze numbers and how they make assumptions. And that will be informed by where you grew up and how you grew up. Um, so we need all these variable, these variable inputs. So that, that's really, as an industry, I think where we need to be taking um, um, private equity as our contribution to the normalization of our society. And diversity of backgrounds, diversity of skills, diversity yeah. of uh, qualifications um, yeah, into the exactly, industry. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Maybe we can get the results, uh, our last slide up in terms of the actual survey results. And then while um, we quickly have a look at results, uh, there's some questions about technological advancements and digitalization considered a competitive differentiator of which 76% said yes. Um, how much do you expect your operating model to transform in the next three years? There's for your company, for your portfolio companies, and in comparison to the global uh, EYPE survey. And then what steps have you taken to enable a remote workforce? So while we're still on a workforce, Mama Dupi, uh, what, what in your view is the, is the PE employee value proposition um, in, in the future in terms of, of what we need to offer talent to fitly come into the industry, but also stay in the industry? Yeah, I think uh, from, um, from our perspective, Tanya, I think I, I looked at it even from just the last couple of months um, in terms of the flexibility of what I guess COVID has allowed, you know, the fact that we're all sitting here, pr probably primarily sitting at home um, and still being able to, you know, do some of the work um, um, that are, I guess, uh, from, a, from a private equity perspective and, and um, execution perspective. Um, the reality, I think for me, from an employee value proposition perspective is that what this period has highlighted is that um, you know, the blurring of lines between, I guess, home and, and work, you know, really means that whatever value proposition we're, we're trying to implement has to have some kind of a, a human centered, I guess, proposition. You know, I think the reality from a work perspective is that, uh, you know, our employees and, and the team are people first um, and, not, and not just workers. You know, and I think throughout this period, um, you know, we as a team specifically have experienced, you know, illness, you know, loss, you know, the, the, the challenges of homeschooling um, and, and I guess the resultant uh, stress that comes with that. 
um, and then having to then weave in you know, your work amongst all of that and deliver. Um, and I think as an employer, um, recognizing this and making and catering for this is probably where we need to start looking at this value proposition. Um, again, coming out of this period for us, for instance, prioritizing you know, mental well-being, you know, and, and emotional well-being has a big, been a, actually a big a key component of, of, of some of the, the work that we've done internally um, and making sure that we have the right support systems um, for, for the team um, in order to assist us with this. So I think, I guess, from a, a, you know, generally around flexibility, you know, if we're talking about diversity, bringing on, you know, I, I, I guess, from my perspective, being, you know, a mother, a female, you know, all of those things, you know, you, you, you want your, your employer to cater for that. Um, and, and I think that's where that, you know, value proposition comes into play. Um, the other thing I think is hiring practices probably have, have changed um, a bit. You know, we, we've hired probably about three people in a lockdown period, you know, and again, we go back to this thing of, private equity is a people business. And how do you show that when you're interviewing people on teams? Um, and the fact that you want to have that connection with your new team members, and quite frankly, they want to have, you know, the same, you know, so really amplifying, you know, the, the culture of the organization and trying to bring that out and make, you know, I guess, being more deliberate about it. Um, also, you know, you need to look at those type of aspects and, 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 and make it clearer around what, what we're offering as a private equity company versus, I guess, you know, the next company. Well, our keynote speaker at this year's SAFCA conference, Stan Slav, actually said, um, be a manager second and be a human, human being first. Um, and that really resonated with me in terms of the support you need to, to give. Um, but it's also about what you yourself need in terms of getting through a very emo emotional period. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I quickly just want to talk about uh, some of the other survey results that came in, and specifically di digitization. Um, Zuko, has this enabled efficiencies within the private equity firm or your portfolio companies at all? Uh, do you see it playing a fundamental role? Yeah, yeah, Tanya. I think what goes in hand with digitization, you know, as you improve your technology and how you do things, is you we often forget to capacitate or upskill the people that are going to be using um, that technology. You know, so if you're changing your filing system and now, because we're trying to get rid of paper usage because it reduces our toner um, usage, which is expensive, you know, uh, but you, you, you have to pull everyone along um, because the technology is there to kind of say, get rid of this, um, sign on your on your devices and where does all this stuff go it goes into the cloud you know what if you're down on the one day and you need a document so 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 you, you gotta you gotta look at all of those things um but but definitely we constantly trying to tweak um our own costs to make our uh, processes of getting documents out and responding to people a lot more efficient um, a lot quicker so that's an ongoing thing but the fact that most of us have been able to travel meant that we spent more time on our devices. So you could actually really, you know, dedicate a lot of time to getting some of these processes in place. So, um, so it has helped to, to have limitations on movements, um, but, but certainly it's a key area for making all of us efficient. Robert DP, have you seen any uh, initiatives or innovations coming from some of your portfolio companies in the digitization realm? So I think, uh, uh, I guess thinking about this question, Tanya, it, it probably is very much industry-based. Um, I think where we have seen, you know, real value coming out of uh, digitization has probably been much less so in the business-to-business -business sector or space and more really around business to consumer type businesses. And a lot of that has really been forced, you know, because of, for instance, the lockdown period and, you know, people having to look at their sales channels um, and, and how they, you know, service consumers, for instance, and, and then having to then implement, it, you know, some kind of digital solution to aid that, you know, so we have seen, for instance, you know, um, more self-service type, uh, you know, apps, for instance, that allow you to, you know, to, to I guess, uh, you know, buy, purchase products or, 
you know, I guess, uh, uh, you know, alleviate customer services uh, queries that would have ordinarily gone through the shop front or through your call center, for instance. Um, you know, but but in the in the B two B space, I think probably a lot more probably needs to be done there. You know, I think it's been limited um, from that perspective in terms of you know how 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 we bring in that technology um, and to 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 impact those delivery models. Graham, I'm going to ask you for final comments, and then I'll also ask you the final question, which is, um, what are EY's views on the newer levers of value creation in PE in general? Um, and then while you answer that question, Mamadupi, Zuko, if um, there's some questions in the QA box, if you want to type in any answers to those, you're more than welcome to do so. But Graham, over to you for some final remarks. Yeah, I think let me expand on some of those points on, on digitization and, and, and newer value creation levers. I think you know, globally we're seeing um, companies know their customers much better because you've got more data and more information and, and being more targeted on, you know, where to grow with those customers. Yes, it probably is more relevant in the B2C as Mama Dupi spoke, but, you know, definitely even in the B2B, you know, really knowing the customers um, and enhancing your value and offering because, you know, if, if your customers are at the center of your business, um, and really understanding, you know, where where they see value and where you can add further service and offering, you know, you can have a, a business uh, being more successful. I mean, yes, we're seeing it in the manufacturing space and and knowing your your assets, uh, you know, machine learning and AI and understanding, you know, real time quality and performance of assets. But you know, for me, I think. The biggest area is is on the impact on on customers and really, I guess, knowing um, how your portfolio companies is is reaching those customers as well as delivering value and getting feedback. Um, and you know, I think that can apply to all businesses um, from B two C to B two B. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to the panel, to our research partner, EY, for the phenomenal work. Um, Sitembile sends her apologies and sorry that she couldn't be with us this afternoon. Um, hopefully she can uh, moderate the next panel. Um, and then in terms of what next, uh, look out for volume two, where we'll be looking at some of the fundraising trends. We'll also look at deal activity, uh, investments uh, and exits uh, in 2020. It will be interesting to see what uh, the impact of COVID has been on the actual uh, deal activity and um, fundraising. In the chat box, you'll see that there's a link to where you can download the report or volume one of the SAFCA private equity survey that we showed you uh, today. Please go through there, uh, download the volume there and um, we will let you know about volume two. We really appreciate your time this afternoon, your good questions, your good comments, and uh, we wish you a great evening. Please uh, stay safe and healthy. Thank you, everyone.